Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patrons, Gary W and PMOC. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. A thread to be aware of, compared to May of last year, the average price for auto insurance is up 17%. The chief economist at Moody's said the pandemic has been really disruptive to the auto repair business. Many auto body shops and auto maintenance companies went out of business during that time. When it comes to the inflation rate in May, we have motor vehicle repair and motor vehicle insurance leading the way. What does this mean for Tesla? Well, more of an opportunity for their mantra, the best service is no service, but of course with Tesla insurance, the ability to hopefully eventually lower better rates with the more data they have as that continues to roll out across the US. Tesla Scope is reporting that the Model Y Performance and the Giga Texas made Model Y Long Range now have a new rear drive unit. Apparently this started June 13th. And this goes contrary to some other reporting that we've heard, but they are saying they're seeing an increase in Model Ys with hardware for on their platform, Presumably though, it's still in small numbers. For this new rear drive unit, all they can say so far is that it has subtle efficiency improvements and utilizes recycled materials. Hopefully more to come when they're able to share. Perhaps even better, they said last night with the updates 2023.12.10 and 11, these are the first updates containing the FSD beta code pushed to the Tesla production and FSD enrolled vehicles across all regions. The layman's explanation for this one is that historically Tesla has had separate branches, which sometimes would keep people with the FSD beta weeks behind in getting some of the new software features that you can see in the UI. Meaning this could be Tesla looking to get away from that separate branch model. And as you can see, it looks like the software label for FSD in the software has been slightly adjusted. We got a new Tesla stock note from UBS after their most recent Giga Berlin factory tour. Of course, they said the factory is running at much higher outputs compared to their last visit quarter three of last year. We've already covered that in the past, but they did say regarding Giga casting, Tesla now has six machinery units installed and another two are to be installed soon. For now, Tesla is only using the gigacasted rear underbody with a conventional 2170 pack, while the front underbody is in trial production. Only after this is fully ramped, Tesla can then use the 4680 structural pack. All batteries currently arrive as finished packs from China. The cell building looks finished from the outside, but there is no production yet, and a timeline for ramping up production of that was not provided. For me, the biggest takeaway was about the front underbody being in trial production. In the past, we had heard that there were some FUBs on site, but perhaps they were sent in from somewhere else. So to hear that the machines presumably are up and running and in trial production would be a good sign. We have Antoine Arnault sharing a picture of his pops, Bernard Arnault and Elon Musk. Bernard is the owner of LVMH, probably the world's biggest luxury brand and cosmetics company. They're the ones that bought Tiffany & Co, which was one of the biggest deals in history in that space. And the last time I checked, these two men were at the top of the list for the Forbes richest men in the world. I'm just speculating here, but my guess is that at least part of this conversation had to do with Twitter and advertising, maybe the budget for LVMH, them understanding how Elon is looking to navigate that platform going forward. In case you haven't been watching right now in the EU, there's a lot going on when it comes to Twitter and regulations. So, you know, just a casual $500 billion lunch conversation on a Friday. And on this one, I would just say, Alexandra, Tesla Boomer Mama, just close your eyes for the next few seconds. There's an awful lot of smiling going on in this picture. At least for right now, this is the only update we get. I got this email from Tesla this morning, assuming many of you did as well, but to celebrate 500,000 Powerwalls installed globally, Tesla is offering a $500 rebate on all Powerwall units installed and registered before October 31st of this year. There are some stipulations and things of that nature, but just putting it on your radar if you're in the market. Speaking of incentives over in China, right now for Model 3 rear wheel drive deliveries, they're offering an 8,000 yuan insurance subsidy, which is equivalent to about 1,100 US dollars. Just a reminder, Tesla has plenty of levers to pull if they need to. We also get an update from Experian when it comes to EV registrations in the United States so far in January through April compared to the same time last 
last year. No surprise, the Model Y N3 topped the list and it's not really close. Third place is most likely going to end production later this year, so the Volkswagen ID4 would be in that next up spot. I'd also point out that from the same time last year, the Model Y registrations have essentially doubled up basically 100%. And we know there are reasons for this. Ford has been retooling production early this year, but the Mach-E and the F-150 Lightning failed to crack the 10,000 unit mark over the span of four months to start this year. And here we're looking at the luxury rankings for the same time period, but this time across overall brands. Again, no surprise, Tesla far and away in the first place spot, but also still growing at the highest rate compared to the same time frame last year, also coming from the highest base. The only other automaker on this list above a 40% growth rate is Audi at 43 and Tesla is at 52. And I want you to see my face for this one. I would also point out that last year, Tesla outsold BMW by about 35,000 units over this time period, which was about 33% higher. Fast forward to the same time period this year, Tesla has outsold BMW by nearly 100%, almost doubling them up. So their lead is actually growing. Remember when we talked about the reporting about Elon's visit to China, how they said nothing got done and I said that's a premature conclusion and that in the weeks ahead we would probably get a slow drip of information? Well, that drip has started. First, we get a bit more color on Tesla's expansion in Shanghai. Currently, it's hinging on China's approvals to develop 70 hectares or 172 acres of former farmland that is currently overgrown with wildflowers. This checks out with what we touched on a few weeks ago that the holdup was based on land. But now we learn there's more. China's state planner has been cautious about approving new EV production plans by all automakers because of concerns about overcapacity and a deepening price war launched by Tesla. Tesla. This is just from one auto advisor in the region, but he's saying that China could have excess auto production capacity of about 10 million vehicles per year. We've known now for a long time Tesla has wanted to double down in China because they can make cars so affordably in that region. And of course, most of the EV supply chain starts and ends over there. And that analyst said, you could argue that as Tesla, I've got new products, I need a new factory. But from the Chinese government point of view, all they see is a market that's oversupplied. The latest extra production capacity number being thrown around is 450,000 units of annual capacity at a new location that would be about two miles from the current Giga Shanghai. And yes, this topic of expansion did come up on Elon's trip. No surprise. Elon told a small group of Tesla staff that he saw positive progress in discussions about the expansion, but did not elaborate. Personally, I would expect some sort of announcement on a Shanghai expansion in the next six to nine months. So can okay. you explain why GM and other car manufacturers have not created Tesla and why Tesla is successful? Uh, what is the difference? General Motors um, actually did come out with this uh, electric vehicle one, EV1, and it's... Uh, yes, you remember, EV1. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, actually, so I, I thought when that it came out... It was 97. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, I would have, I, I expected there would be an EV2, EV3, and so forth, and if, if they had done that, actually there would be no need for Tesla. Um, but um, for reasons that, that aren't clear, they... GM uh, recalled all of the EV1s, even from customers that really wanted to keep the cars. They recalled the cars and they crushed them in a junkyard. The, the, it, it, blows, it, it still blows my mind that they did this because the, the, the people who had the EV1s, they loved the car so much, they held a candlelit vigil at the junkyard where the cars were crushed. Okay, like it was, like, like someone was getting killed, <laughs> you know, like. And it's, and it's like, if somebody is holding a candlelit vigil for the because they love your product so much, maybe you should make more of it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, it's like pretty rare for candlelit vigils to be held for products. So I, I don't understand why they didn't do more. They should have, and they would be the leader in electric vehicles today. But they didn't. They, they didn't. And so there was a need for Tesla because the, you know, at the time of starting Tesla, there were no electric vehicles being made. I mean, in the case of both Tesla and SpaceX, I thought the chance of success was maybe 10%. So I just felt like I thought it would be successful. I thought it would fail.
and boy, are we glad they did try and didn't fail. Uh, I mean, I've, when I've tweeted, I think the stock price is too high, almost always it goes up. So, I don't know, it's, it's a strange thing. So, I, I guess in the, in the case of Tesla, if, if the, 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 really, the, the value of the company is primarily uh, on the basis of autonomy. So, uh, in, in my opinion, um, because if you look at our total vehicle output, it's, um, you know, it'll be almost two million vehicles this, this year or something like that. Um, but that's, that's still only 2% of total vehicle production. So then why is our market cap so high? And it's because the potential for autonomy um, is, uh, is it, that the, the value of autonomy is so high um, that even, even if you have a discounted percentage probability of autonomy happening, um, that is still incredibly valuable. Um, so the average passenger car is uh, used only about 10 hours a week, so an average of about one and a half hours a day. But if you have an autonomous robo-taxi, the utility is, might be 50 or 60 hours a week out of 168 hours. So now you've got a vehicle that costs the same but has five times the utility. So it's so gigantic a change that that's really, I think, uh, the main driver of our value. Um, and uh, although I've said this before, I think we will solve autonomy soon. <laughs> did, did you expect that uh, Tesla will be at this level of market cap? Uh, no, I did not expect Tesla would be at this level of market cap. Because it's just extraordinary, uh, yeah. unfair, I, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I don't set the price, so... Yeah, <laughs> you don't set. <laughs> this line that Elon likes to keep talking about, about Tesla's valuation being heavily tied to robo-taxis, obviously makes sense, but I would actually push on it a little bit because at least right now, most of Wall Street really isn't attributing any value to Tesla for this business line. And of course, a lot of us know all of the depths and intricacies of why Tesla is so different that we've been talking about now for the last few years. So the way I always interpret Elon when he says that is he just loves reinforcing the magnitude that most people can't really comprehend when it comes to robo taxis and FSD. But even taking that away, hypothetically, there's still a very valuable business left at Tesla as it stands today. And I think all of you get that and understand that, but in case a few don't, I just wanna make that very clear. Today, from Reuters, we have SK Signet, who counts Electrify America and EVgo and others as customers, saying they've started development of ultra-fast chargers that will simultaneously charge EVs with the NACs and CCS. Earlier this month, SK opened its first United States state's manufacturing center in Texas with the capacity to make more than 10,000 ultra-fast chargers per year. And yes, it's already been added to the NAX adoption tracker on EV station. We got yet another shot of the Model 3 Project Highland, but this time you can see a little bit of the potentially new rear taillight. This tweet is also out there getting a bit of traction, and I just want to clarify this little ditty over on the right. This is a render. This has nothing to do officially from Tesla, if that wasn't clear. Although, yeah, I definitely like how it looks. Here's a zoomed in image if you want to take a second and look around. And don't forget if you're on mobile, you can still pinch and zoom in on videos if you forgot about that feature. I also just want to mention some people are taking this rumor and making it to seem like it's definitely happening that Tesla is showcasing the new Model 3 Project Highland at the Shenzhen Auto Show. Just to be clear, this event is happening today, but so far, as far as we can all tell, that is just a rumor. Rivian's finance chief said he expects demand for pickups and their SUV to remain stable throughout the year, despite all of the macro noise. He also said Rivian is ramping up production of its in-house drive unit ahead of plan. Our priority right now is ramping production and driving down costs so that we're starting to really reduce the level of cash burn within the business. This one is just great to hear and we'll be giving it up for Illinois in a moment. Newly built and renovated homes in Illinois will next year be required to support EV charging stations in their garages and parking spaces under a new state law. This law goes into effect January 1st, 2024. A new single family residence or a small multifamily residence shall have at least one EV capable parking space for each residential unit that has dedicated parking. Additionally, large multifamily residential buildings like a block of apartments or condos that are being renovated by a developer, converting it into an association 
Association must have 100% of its total parking spaces EV capable. The law also allows for renters to install EV charging equipment in their parking spaces at their own expense. Ford has broken ground on its new EV battery park in Michigan, but there was a special meeting held last night. Apparently, some residents are not happy with the recent decision that changed this area of land to commercial. Basically, this is a NIMBY situation, so we'll see what happens in the next few days. We have Electrek reporting that Rivian is set to buy a better route planner. Most importantly, Rivian has no plans to shut down either the front end service for other EV owners who want to use a better route planner on non-Rivian EVs, nor the back end service for other car makers. And while these comments are good to hear from Rivian now, I will not be surprised if in the next few years this slowly becomes more of a Rivian only thing or maybe they start charging fees, royalties, whatever for other automakers to actually use this service. So it seems like Rivian's not that interested in getting its hands on Tesla's route planning software so we'll see what that means for NAC's adoption and all of that in the weeks ahead. You can find me on Twitter at DylanLoomis22. Hope you guys have a wonderful and a safe weekend. Please like the video if you did and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.